not using a microphone, maybe I should, I'll speak up. My name is Tony Fusco, I'm the co-producer of the show. This is our 17th annual Boston International Fine Art Show. And we're pleased to have you all here tonight. We hope you're enjoying yourself, we hope you're enjoying the show. And if you are, we hope you'll tell all your friends. Uh, tomorrow, we're here Saturday and Sunday, and we have other fantastic programs both days. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Bill Varica, and to do that, I need to put on my glasses. <laughs> Bill is a gallery owner, a specialist in 19th century American art, a writer, a lecturer, a community activist, a preservationist, and as you know, a philanthropist. Bill is a 1974, are you letting me say the date? <laughs> graduate from Boston College and he abandoned his law school plans in order to volunteer to direct a six-year legal battle to save a historic John Lafarge decorated church in Newport, Rhode Island. He later took another leave of absence from graduate studies in American Civilization at Brown University in order to begin his career as an art dealer, opening his Bellevue Avenue Newport Gallery in 1987. He served on numerous boards and advisory committees of arts, cultural, environmental, social service, and educational organizations, and he <coughs> received many awards for his philanthropic work. He served as vice chairman of the Rhode Island State Arts Council on the Arts, and currently serves on the Rhode Island State House Restoration Society. He's a trustee of the Newport Festivals Foundation and of Historic New England. He was awarded an honorary doctorate of Humane Letters by Salve Regina University on May 15, 2011. Bill and Allison Varica have three children and four dogs. <laughs> and they live in an 1877 National Historic Register home in Newport, which they have been restoring for 25 years. <laughs> Bill is going to introduce our other speakers. Enjoy the program. Thank you. I certainly would like to thank Tony and Robert, the promoters of BIFAS, for allowing me in an unprecedented way to devote part of my exhibition booth to highlight the McMullen Museum's new John Lafarge opalescent leaded glass windows and to offer the three related lectures this evening. My mission is to use this weekend arts forum to accomplish two goals. First, to raise awareness about the activities of the McMullen Museum at Boston College at age 20, an important and vital Boston cultural institution referred to by the Wall Street Journal as the little museum that could. But not as well known as it should be, open and free to the public, and about which we will hear more later from museum director Nancy Metzer. And second, to raise some interest in and funding for the project to restore the Lafarge windows a fascinating process about which we will learn more shortly from stained glass conservator Roberto Rosa. I would also like to join Tony in welcoming you all here tonight. I would like to acknowledge first several legendary Boston College people in attendance, three of my favorite Jesuits, the distinguished 25th president of BC, William P. Leahy, who has overseen unprecedented growth in the stature and financial strength of the 150-year-old university over his 17-year tenure, the former president, current chancellor of BC, and the father of the McMullen Museum, J. Donald Monin, and the BC vice president and special assistant to the president, who has been called the soul of the university, William B. Neenan. I'd also like to acknowledge descendants of John Lafarge with us tonight, Christa Lafarge, Christopher Lafarge and his wife Vicky, and Albert Lafarge, who was expected to be here and I think um, is running late. Finally, I'd like to recognize members of the lay leadership of the Amherst Universalist Society, from which Allison and I purchased the windows, Darcy Dumont and Janice Gray. These women of faith helped make a long and complicated and sometimes contentious process of negotiation much more pleasant and successful. And the Reverend Allison Wohler of the Society is also with us this evening, as are perhaps one or two other members of uh, the Society from Amherst.
Over the next 20 minutes, I would like to present a brief snapshot of the life and art of one of the most important, influential, and interesting cultural figures of the 19th century in America, while weaving into that colorful chronicle the unique story of my own personal journey in search of John Lafarge. You can all read a book about John Lafarge and his art, so this will not be an art history lecture. Instead, I would like to tell you about how John Lafarge changed my life, and likewise, how in some small way, I may have been able to impact his legacy. In 1971, I was a 19-year-old sophomore political science pre-law major at BC, who chose to take Professor John Baker's 19th century art history course as part of a required Jesuit liberal arts core curriculum, mostly because it fit into my schedule. When it came time for the first exam, I was ill-prepared and went to see the professor to take him up on his first day of class offer of an independent research paper in lieu of exams. Of course, he was outraged. <laughs> outraged that I would appear so late after other students had been diligently working on approved topics for over a month. But seeing the desperation in my eyes, he gave me 24 hours to come up with a noteworthy proposal. I happened to have a work-study job at the Boston Public Library in Copley Square at the time, and routinely spent my lunch breaks across the street in Trinity Church, a quiet place to practice my daily transcendental meditation, a common interest among some inquisitive youth in that era. <laughs> Literally the day that my thesis topic was due, I awoke from my meditation to see the most glorious painted murals and stained glass windows, as if for the first time, wondering if by chance they were painted within the 19th century scope of Professor Baker's class. <laughs> a quick perusal of a brochure in the lobby of the church proved promising as the artist that collaborated with the great Henry Hobson Richardson in the decoration of one of the most iconic buildings in American history, John Lafarge, was in fact from the 19th century. A quick return to the art history department stacks at the BPL, not Google in those <coughs> days, afforded me the resources to write a proposal that emphasized the artist's eclecticism and many artistic and intellectual connections and influences in 19th century art throughout the world. Professor Baker was wise enough to realize that an exploration of John Lafarge would teach me virtually everything I needed to know about 19th century art, and he approved the topic, with the warning that it would require much original research, as little had been written about the artist in many decades. In fact, at that time, Lafarge had been almost forgotten by all but the most serious art scholars and collectors. However, I was not deterred as I was saved from a disastrous term examination, but little did I know that this academic commitment would come to change my life. My research paper turned out to be over 100 pages long with numerous illustrations of Lafarge's work that I photographed from my travels along the East Coast, seeking out the artist's art in public and private collections. I was blessed with much good luck in gaining access to Lafarge collections and sites of the artist's public works and many courtesies from the experts who guided me in my research. One day, an elderly, white-haired man in a painter's smock approached me in the midst of a snowstorm on the Boylston Street sidewalk alongside the Boston Public Library subway stop and said that he had heard that I was researching John Lafarge, offering the suggestion that I contact John Coolidge at the Fogg Museum for guidance, who proved to be very helpful. Impressed by the monumental effort of my project, my professor encouraged me to consider changing my major to art history. <laughs> I declined explaining that I still plan to attend law school and hope to devote my life to public service in order to change the world. <laughs> but he did convince me to continue my work on Lafarge with another independent research project in my senior year, which brought me to Newport for the first time in the spring of 1974. 
So here we are in Newport. This was 115 years after John Lafarge arrived in that historic city by the sea in the spring of 1859 from his native New York City, where he had been apprenticing in a law firm. He came to Newport at the suggestion of his friend, the architect Richard Morris Hunt, to study art in the studio that Richard's older brother, William Morris Hunt, had recently opened on the historic hilltop just blocks from where our gallery is located today. Lafarge would continue to live in Newport on and off until his death in 1910. As destiny would have it, immediately upon arriving in Newport, I was thrust into a battle to save an endangered historic church with an entire intact Lafarge decorative scheme of murals and opalescent le leaded glass windows. I literally walked into a Newport antique shop because I had locked my keys of my Volkswagen Beetle with the engine running <laughs> and needed the use of a phone long before cell phones. And the suspicious lady proprietor, three times plus my age, asked me who I was and why I was there. I had a ponytail and a beard at the time. <laughs> I said that I was Bill Vareka from Boston College and that I was in Newport in search of John Lafarge. Startled by my response, she asked me to repeat what I had said. <laughs> it turned out coincidentally that she was part of a small group of members of the Lafarge decorated church that I had come to Newport to visit that had opposed the recent sale of the building to a businessman with unknown future plans for the property. <laughs> as the majority of the congregation had voted to move to another town to worship in a new building. By coincidence, she was hosting a meeting that very night of the opposition group, and she insisted that I stay for the meeting. She fed me dinner and then introduced me to the handful of church dissidents as a Lafarge expert. <laughs> I told the group that the problem I heard described was one not just for the people in the room, nor for Newport alone, but one of national significance. Motivated by the idealism of my youth and my times, the influence of my Jesuit educators, and my newfound obsession with Lafarge, I naively volunteered my summer months after graduation and before entering law school to help to save the building. The legal case that I engineered legal, lingered in the courts for six years and my career plans changed. Among the jobs that helped support me during this time was a stint as the part-time janitor at the Newport Art Museum, where I later spent over 20 years on the board, <laughs> and working as a picker of artworks, the most modest level of art dealing, for which I unexpectedly appeared to show some promise. One of the major attractions for Lafarge in Newport, beyond the idyllic coastal landscape, the strong patron class, and the vital intellectual community was Margaret Perry of the famous Rhode Island family. Despite the Perry family's objections that Margaret marry a Roman Catholic artist, they were married in 1860. I found similar calling from my muse, Allison, and we were married in 1985 in the newly saved Lafarge Decorated Congregational Church. The church where Allison had become moderator during the legal battle, and I, a Roman Catholic and graduate of a Jesuit university, served as a deacon. My strategy was to keep the nearly 300-year-old church institution alive as a rationale for saving the building. The struggle was arduous and often contentious. I faced threats of personal lawsuits and other recriminations as I was labeled a carpetbagger and a troublemaker for my efforts to leave the crusade to save the building. Happily, a small congregation continues to worship today in the building, which was recently awarded prestigious national landmark status. Just last week, I attended a meeting at the church of preservationists from around the country to discuss ongoing preservation efforts and future adaptive uses for the church. In time, I became, began my own private art dealing business in a small carriage house where I lived with Allison, one block from the John Lafarge and Margaret Perry home 
where the couple's son, John Lafarge, later a famous Jesuit priest, was born in 1880, the year that his father undertook the Newport Congregational Church decorations. Father Lafarge died 50 years ago this weekend, on November 25th, 1863, several months after he participated in the Civil Rights March on Washington. John and Margaret had nine children, and seven survived infancy. My first major, <coughs> my first major art inventory purchase was a small Lafarge watercolor of the sea, which I later sold to the National Gallery of Art. My art dealing specialized in artworks by the important American artists who, like Lafarge, had been attracted to Newport and the Narragansett Bay region in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries. By 1987, our business and family had outgrown the small carriage house setting that also served as our home, and we opened a large gallery at our current location on historic Bellevue Avenue in order to be able to mount exhibitions mainly on the theme of important Newport related artists. We pledged to utilize the appeal of our exhibitions to raise public consciousness and funds for charitable causes with which we were involved in the community. Our first major project of this type was the 1989 exhibition John Lafarge and American Master which supported the Lafarge mural and stained glass restoration project at the Newport Congregational Church, which I had come to Newport to save. This exhibit was the first major gallery exhibition of Lafarge's works since the 1960s, and one of the largest ever, featuring over 100 paintings, watercolors, drawings, prints, and opalescent leaded glass windows by the artist. The show received national attention and attracted funding for the restoration project from sources from within and outside of the Rhode Island community. We continue to include Lafarge artworks in many of the exhibitions we curated and advertised in national arts and news media. In 1995, we mounted another major Lafarge exhibition, John Lafarge in Paradise, The Painter and His Muse, which focused on Lafarge's work in a neighborhood called Paradise, near to Newport, where the artist lived and worked in the 1860s and early 1870s and produced some of the most important, precocious, and memorable art of his career and of the entire 19th century. It was during this period that some con commentators maintained that the artist painted the first Impressionist experiments created on American soil. This exhibition also featured over 100 artworks, including loans from many museum and private collections throughout the US, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The artist's iconic 1867 depiction of the Last Valley was illustrated on the cover of the book-sized catalog that we published to accompany our Paradise Show, and the painting was later purchased by the National Gallery of Art for over $2 million. The painting represented Lafarge at the Paris Salon of 1874 and the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition of 1876, where it was awarded a medal for artistic merit in landscape. In the course of just a couple of decades, the obscure artist who had such an enigmatic appeal to a young student had become a very precious art commodity. Great personal satisfaction came to me in 2006 when I was able to purchase the fascinating experimental 1864 Lafarge oil painting in the forest, probably painted in paradise, when it was deaccessioned for God knows what reason from the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts, where it had been given in 1914. For 35 years before, I had actually purchased an 8 by 10 inch black and white photograph of this jewel from the MFA Photography Department to illustrate my thesis for Professor Baker's class. This painting is currently on loan to the Great Corbet Exhibition at the McMullen Museum, as it clearly reveals the influence on Lafarge of the great French realist master. Allison and I are humbled by the fact that over the years we have been in the art business, we have probably owned and handled more artworks by John Lafarge than anyone in history. Many of these were well known and recorded and illustrated in the books. Others seem to mysteriously appear within my grasp by faith. One example is the day that I was driving to meet up with my wife and family for a weekend at a main ski resort. And having left my gallery much later than planned, was likely to miss the deadline of dinner time. 
It would not be able to stop at any antique shops en route, one of my favorite pastimes. A snowstorm delayed my travel even further, but shortly after I left the highway and was speeding along a dark country road, I passed an antique shop that appeared open with lights aglow. I jammed on the brakes and made a quick U-turn and ran to the front door, which was unlocked. I entered and confirmed with the attendant that she was still open, but just for a few minutes longer. I immediately, across a long, cluttered room, noticed a very interesting, small, dark painting hanging above a wood-burning stove. As I approached, I asked if I could examine it off the wall, actually finding it too hot to handle. The attendant asked if I was a dealer, offering me a discount from the price on the sticker. I wrote the fastest check ever <laughs> and was speeding off to meet up with my family with a rare Lafarge still life of flowers on a Japanese tray sitting on the seat next to me. The large pair of religious panels on the screen on the right came to me from a London country estates auction by way of a Spanish estate after I had been searching for these important 1862 artworks since 1983 that had been lost to the field for half a century since they were deaccessioned by the Whitney Museum. Thirty-five years after I was accidentally thrust into the saga of the Newport Lafarge Church, destiny once again challenged me to action regarding another endangered Lafarge decorative arts collection. This time it was a member of the Sisters of Mercy who telephoned me to inform me that an old convent that her religious order had occupied at a Fall River parish was about to be raised to make way for parking spaces. I knew the convent well because it had contained <coughs> a chapel with 13 stained glass windows and other furnishings originally designed by John Lafarge for a private chapel in a Newport home that was demolished during the Great Depression. A far-sighted bishop had acquired the sacred and precious contents at that time and reassembled them in the Fall River Convent. I immediately mobilized a group to attempt to save the artworks intact. While the parish was seriously entertaining proposals from auction houses that would sell the contents piecemeal to the highest bidders, I made a proposal to purchase them that would keep the Lafarge decorative scheme intact by bringing the chapel contents back to Newport to be housed in various buildings at Salve Regina University a Sisters of Mercy institution where the objects would be appreciated as beautiful and important works of art and also meaningful ecclesiastical symbols. After several years of very difficult negotiations in which I involved nas national preservation forces and local political and church contacts, our proposal was finally accepted, but not before I was labeled a ruffian <laughs> by one diocesan priest who was intent on scattering the Lafarge works around the globe if that yielded the highest price. While the windows were undergoing restoration at Serpentino Studios, I told the story of the preservation project to a visitor to my gallery who shocked the university president by offering to underwrite the construction of a previously unplanned campus chapel to house the Lafarge windows. Our third major Lafarge exhibition, John Lafarge, American Artistic Genius and Renaissance Man, was mounted in 2009 to help to raise funding to restore these windows. The show of over 100 Lafarge artworks, including eight of the Fall River windows, some partially restored, received national attention, including new, new notice in the New York Times. I was also very proud that Jesuit and former Georgetown University President Leo O'Donovan reviewed the show for America, the Jesuit magazine that Father John Lafarge served as editor and writer from 1926 until his death. In 2010, the Robert Stern Design Chapel and Spiritual Life Center, incorporating the 13 Lafarge windows, was dedicated. A wonderful example of how art and a preservation effort inspired a new building that will be utilized and appreciated by generations of students, scholars, and the public. Over a long career, John Lafarge made significant and often revolutionary contributions in many creative fields. Landscape painting.
flower painting. Figure painting. Mural decoration. Stained glass window design and construction. Travel journalism, including his 1886 trip to Japan and 1891 trip to the South Seas, both with his friend Henry Adams. Book and magazine illustration. Art teaching, writing, and criticism. And you can see examples of all of the books that John Lafarge authored in my bookcase in my booth. In 1889, Lafarge was awarded the French Legion of Honor, mainly due to his accomplishments, accomplishments in stained glass, as he was credited with creating an entirely new art form, painting in glass, using the medium of opalescent glass and several revolutionary patented techniques, like plating, that we will hear more about from Roberto in a few minutes. With his decorative career in full form, this was the year that Lafarge received a commission from members of the All Souls Unitarian Church on Warren Avenue in Roxbury to produce a number of stained glass windows to decorate the sanctuary. By the way, this church is only two miles from where we sit tonight. Among these were a large triptych representing St. John the Evangelist, Christ Preaching, and St. Paul the Apostle, which were installed in the apse. Around 1925, the building was sold to another denomination, and the original donors of the triptych requested that the windows be removed. They were given to the American Unitarian Association, which in turn gave them to the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst, which was undergoing a remodeling and expansion project in 1925. Late last year, I received word that the members of the Amherst Society had voted to sell the Lafarge triptych for four reasons. The Christian symbolism was determined not to be fitting for Unitarianism. The windows required costly restoration. Church building expansion was needed and funds were required for construction. The only place to expand the building was through the wall where the windows were installed. I was told that several auction houses were eager to receive the windows on consignment for sale. At least one proposal included the shocking recommendations that the scriptural inscriptions at the tops of the windows and that the memorial citations at the bottom should be removed to make the windows more appealing on the art market and that the triptych be broken up with each window being offered for sale individually. In a case of, case of deja vu and with great faith as I did not have the financial means at hand, I responded with the proposal that Allison and I purchase the triptych and gift the windows intact to the McMullen Museum on its 20th anniversary and as part of the sesquicentennial celebration at Boston College. I knew that BC had been planning to build a new art museum space in the future and believed that the windows would be an appropriate permanent fixture in such a facility. My goal was to return the windows to Boston and to a Jesuit Catholic institution where the Christian symbolism would be meaningful. St. John was the great writer of Gospels, who was often symbolized by the eagle, also the BC mascot. <laughs> Christ's preaching symbolizes the teaching mission of a Jesuit university. St. Paul was the great missionary. Our proposal was not accepted initially as the lawyers on the board lobbied for any business resolution that was likely to produce the very highest price. But over time, the church leadership agreed to our terms as it seemed like a very fitting outcome. In September, we donated the windows to BC, and they will be restored as the funds are raised to cover the costs. Once again, I was lucky to find myself in the right place at the right time. This experience and the others that I discuss are testament to the advice that John Lafarge's friend, William James, gives us all. The great use of life is to spend it for something that outlasts it. Thank you.
visible in Serpentino stained glass ink, Anita Mass. Roberto's experience in the restoration field and his studies in art began in Rome, Italy, where he lived for 12 years. He joined Serpentino stained glass in 1988, making it his goal to specialize in quality restoration and conservation of historic stained glass windows. Roberto continues to be hands-on hands -on, on all of Serpentino's restoration projects. Roberto has restored numerous important windows in some of America's most prominent buildings, including the Massachusetts State House, Trinity Church, Church of the Covenant, Boston, the First Church of Christ Scientist, Boston, Houghton Chapel at Wellesley College, Boston College, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, Temple Emmanuel, New York City, St. Thomas Episcopal Church, New York City, Knott Memorial at Union College, and the Princeton University Chapel. In a project that I've already discussed, Roberto was the chief conservator for 13 opalescent glass windows at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island, by John Lafarge, his favorite stained glass artist. <laughs> Roberto is a founding member of the American Glass Guild, an international organization dedicated to education. He's also a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works a member of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Association for Preservation Technology, and the Boston Preservation Alliance. It gives me great personal pleasure to introduce Roberto, who will speak on conservative restoration, my relationship with John LaFarge and his opalescent glass windows. Roberto. <laughs> So as Bill said, um, my lecture will be more about what's involved in restoration of stained glass and particularly John Lafarge, the challenges we find in uh, restoring Lafarge windows and our love and affection for John Lafarge and his artwork. As Bill stated, he was obviously a oil painter, a muralist, and um, decorating uh, some of America's most interesting and beautiful buildings, Trinity Church, Church of the Ascension in New York, uh, to name just a couple. And later in life, I believe in his 40s, he got involved in stained glass, which actually gave him greater fame than his murals and oil painting. He got involved in stained glass, as I stated, early, uh, late in his life, and uh, in 1874, um, he was approached by Ware and Van Brunt to design windows for Memorial Hall at Harvard University. And as Lafarge was not happy and, um, with the type of glass and materials that were available to him at the time, mainly pot metal glass, traditional materials and glass that had been used since medieval days, and uh, that's all that he had available to him. And as he quoted, it was like he could design anything, but it was like writing or composing music that no one could play. So he was unhappy with the results and with uh, the glass that was available to him, so he in a way, put it aside, this is the original sketch for the battle window at Memorial Hall. And uh, it wasn't until really 1878 that he later, as he thought about, okay, <laughs> if I'm not happy with the glass that I have available to me, I gotta think of something else and how am I gonna create something that I really like? And interestingly enough, as he, had, as he was decorating Trinity Church in Boston, uh, the conditions were not perfect. Uh, the, when the, the church was not, uh, let's say, weather tight, and the, the openings of the windows were not enclosed, and so he got sick. And while he was in bed um, recovering from a flu, there was a little 
and it's not this particular one, but something similar to this uh, a toilet uh, or pillbox, or if you will, uh, glassware, tableware made of opalescent glass that just the way the sunlight hit that particular medicine bottle that gave him the idea that perhaps there was some other material that he could use in stained glass. Opalescent glass had been used for centuries for bottles, uh, glassware, tableware, but never in stained glass. But the way this, um, again, the way the light just hit the bottle or the medicine bottle that was on his windowsill just gave him the idea that perhaps there was something to it that he could use in stained glass. So, he did approach local glassmakers in New York, in Brooklyn, and after years of trial and error, he did install actually the window, uh, one of the battle window at Memorial Hall at Harvard, and he was unhappy with the results, removed it at his own expense, and basically told him, I'm not happy with it, and when I come up with something different that I'm happy with and I like it, we'll come back and create it and install it. So this is the battle window that is currently at Memorial Hall, designed by Lafarge, which was probably one of his uh, most prominent or biggest commission at the time before it became really famous. So the difference or the uniqueness of Lafarge windows versus the traditional stained glass windows, and I'm going to move the microphone if I can, talk really loud. <laughs> so this is your traditional stained glass window and you'll see that this is one piece of glass with the flowers painted, with the details painted. The leaves are all hand painted and it's, it's basically one big piece of green glass and that's how stained glass is typically made and traditionally made. One piece of green glass and all the detail is painted, fired in a kiln for permanency of the paint. In a Lafarge window this is a flower, and you can see that the petals of the flower are little tiny pieces of glass versus one big piece of glass hand-painted. The same with the leaves. They're not one big piece of glass, they're just individual tiny pieces of glass. So that is really the beauty and the difference between a traditional stained glass window and a Lafarge window, and what makes it really unique and um, more um, really realistic in a way. The movement of the leaves and the flowers. So these are one of his um, early opalescent glass windows at the Newport Congregational Church. Again, nothing fancy, just plain white opalescent glass, but yet very detailed and um, different than your typical traditional stained glass. Here's an example of one of the windows we restored at Trinity Church, New Jerusalem. And on the right, you can see a detail of the top panel with what Lafarge called uh, chunk or broken glass jewels. And each piece is just chunks of broken up pieces of glass that he embedded into lead, creating this very unique sea of glass wrapped in lead and soldered. Um, obviously something very different and unusual at the time. In restoring Lafarge windows, we find, we often, if not always, find different material he views, different glass, different techniques. For the New Jerusalem window, let me just go back a little bit, some of the columns in the uh, background, which you can see a detail here, it's actually real alabaster. And it's not unusual in Lafarge windows to find uh, unusual material, glass, uh, ruby, emerald, different things. Another interesting and different approach of Lafarge glass, stained glass window fabrication is the layering or plating of the windows. Traditionally, stained glass windows, as I said earlier, it's one layer of glass, painted, fired, Lafarge developed this technique of layering of, or plating the windows 
two, three, four, sometimes five, sometimes six layers of glass, creating this very interesting and unique depth and three-dimensionality to a window. This is a sample, an example of one of the sections of New Jerusalem from Trinity, where you have five layers of glass. One of the issues somebody asked me earlier tonight as we were admiring the uh, triptych outside um, on, in Bill's booth, what causes the windows to get dark over years? And it's mainly dirt, soot, candle smoke. One thing to remember and to realize is that on a plated or layered window, it's not just soot and dirt on the surface of the glass. You have five layers of glass. You essentially have 10 layers of dirt and soot and candle smoke or whatever, because it's on the surface, on the underside, on the top side of the next one, and so forth and so on. So over time, it reduces and diminishes the quality and quantity of sunlight coming through the window, not to mention the tall buildings that are built over the time blocking the sunlight. And here's some example of, which I'll be happy to uh, discuss when later, if, if anyone is interested in actually seeing up close and in person, the layering of window. On the, on the left, you'll see that it's one piece of glass. <coughs> this will work, I don't know. So here, no, it doesn't. So here you have one big piece of glass on top of this, so it's really what's under this piece of glass, it's many or several pieces of glass, sometimes um, four, five, ten different or variety of pieces of glass. And, you know, the rule of thumb is typically or tradition of stained glass, one may find ten to thirty pieces of glass in a square foot. It's not unusual in a Lafarge window to find 20 or 30 pieces of glass in a square inch. And it has to do with the layering and just because he was obsessive with tiny pieces of glass and perfection. And sometimes we find literally piles of dirt, <coughs> whatever pieces of wood, termites, spider nests. <laughs> These are not the far windows, by the way. Just, just want to show you the uh, effect or the issues of plating and what we find often. So in conservation, there's obviously challenges and issues, and uh, these are this is an, an example of one of the windows from Sala Regina that uh, Bill talked about earlier. We we had the pleasure to restore. These are some of the. Uh, ornamental windows and previously these windows have had been restored and although in today's standard it's unorthodox and not good practice you see the uh, these lead lines covering what are cracks over the glass but I have to admit that in a way I have to respect the fact that whoever did these repairs although it's obtrusive and not and based on today's standard, but at least he kept the original glass in the windows. So what we do today, luckily we have methods and means of restoring these cracked pieces so that the cracks can be minimized and almost invisible. So at the top you see the glass with the lead lines or Dutchman repairs, basically lead strips placed over the cracks to hide the cracks and on the bottom is the cracks repaired and conserved with epoxies and silicones. And here's the window that particular one installed in Sal Regina Chapel. Our goal as conservators, at least our goal, speaking of um, our studio, is is just that, conservation and restoration and maintaining as much as the original materials as possible. Many may think that glass is what really makes a window, and it's true, but on a Lafarge window, in a Lafarge window, it's not just a glass. It's really the lead lines that create the artistry in a window, in my opinion. 
So during the Salva Regina project and all of our project really, but this was really a unique opportunity to conserve these 13 windows. And our goal from the beginning was to, con to retain as much as the original lead as possible. And I'll never forget my first meeting with Sister Therese at Salva Regina um, when I first met them about my approach to restore these 13 windows. And I said, we should really try to keep as all, all or as much as the original lead as possible. And she said to me, well, we've gotten three other proposals and they're all saying that's not possible. But I stressed that it was really important to, to keep the lead because in my opinion, again, that is part of the fabric of the window and the importance of the window. And after she visited our studio and she was off to her next meeting to another studio, her assistant said, we really have to go because we have a meeting with the other studio in an hour. And she said, well, I'm calling it off. I've already made my decision. <laughs> and I had to respect that, and I respected Sister Tree's involvement, and she was dedicated, and she knew what she wanted, and she was approachable and very educated throughout the whole project. So we were able to retain and keep probably 80% of the original lead in all of the windows at Salva Regina. And again, here, hopefully you can hear me. Um, you can sort of see the shinier lead is new, but everything else, the darker, let's say, lead or strips of lead you see here, it's all original. All of this is original, all of this is original. We really were able to keep most of the original lead, which was really um, what we intended to do, and we were happy that we were able to do that. Here's a close-up of some new lead with most of old lead. So when you're working on a Lafarge window, and, and I was talking to Christopher and Vicky Lafarge earlier, this is really what we deal with. I mean, that's a nickel, and that's the size of, oftentimes, the size of the glass that we work with, um, really require, requiring either very little fingers or tweezers to uh, put the window back together. But this is not unusual for Lafarge window. And uh, I'll show a slide later of the old philosopher, one of the Lafarge windows we, uh, I worked on uh, years ago from the Crane Library in Quincy. It was unfortunately stolen and find, luckily they, they, it was returned to the library. Uh, it was Lafarge's first attempt to cloisonne, a different technique that he used in stained glass where he fused glass, tiny pieces of glass, copper filaments, metal, sandwiched between two pieces of clear glass and just fired in a kiln and just kind of melted it all together. And it, it really, it worked, but it didn't work structurally. But just to give you an example, again, of Lafarge's obsess with detail and little tiny pieces of glass, the ear of the, ear of the old philosopher measures about half of an inch wide by three quarters of an inch tall. So it's a really small ear. And it has about 18 pieces of glass. Another issue that we sometimes find in restoration of Lafarge and uh, Lafarge windows is the fact that he was an oil painter by training. And when he got involved in stained glass, he he, he knew the techniques of stained glass, he knew how to fabricate stained glass, and he obviously was a talented painter. But oftentimes, after the windows were installed, he would go back and apply oil paint to the surface of the pieces that he had already painted, whether they were too light or too dark. But sometimes the original paint wasn't either fired well enough or not. The paint wasn't properly applied. We really don't know why a lot of times so often his painted pieces would fail. 
So one of the issues we found at uh, St. John at Salvador and Gina was the fact that St. John, half of his face was deteriorated and we now had to restore and conserve and bring back St. John's face. So we gave the university and Sister Therese the options of how best to do it, what her options were as far as bringing back St. John's face or half of his face and <clears throat> One option, actually, that they seriously considered was actually leaving it as is because it is an old window and there was some uniqueness to that. But the majority of the uh, people voted to bring back St. John's face. So first step was really photographing and documenting the, the amount of paint that was deteriorated and, and uh, Fading is really not the right terminology, but it, it's just, it's gone. It's lifted off the painted piece. The, the glass was brought to the MFA in Boston and tested by Dr. Newman at the MFA, and he determined that the paint that was stable and remained on the glass was fired, but the paint that had flaked off or had left the piece was actually oil paint. I wasn't in John LaFarge's studio at the time, so I don't know what happened to the half of St. John's face and why half of it was stable and half of it wasn't, but the reality was that half of St. John's face was gone, so we had to recreate St. John's face. So luckily we have really great group of craftsmen that work for me and uh, they're as dedicated as I am and love the craft and the art and Matthew Fallon who is here today redesigned what we or what we felt was the rest of St. John's face and we have to be sensitive to as artists really not create what we want but be respectful of what we think John Lafarge or whoever the artist was to recreate what was there. So we first started with the pencil rendering of St. John and then we moved to, so this is a, an entire pencil sketch that Matthew Fallon uh, did of St. John's face. He then started penciling in with colored pencils only what was missing, the only, only what colors and detail was missing. We moved then to more and more detail on the right. Slowly filling it in now with actual artist oil paints and colors and filling in, you can see on the right side, what is essentially what was missing from St. John's face. So here's a series of all the sketches. These are full-size sketches of um, St. John's face from the beginning to the last sketch on the bottom right. And we were then selecting colors, different oil paints that we found on the original on his right side. <coughs> and here's the before and after of St. John's face. St. Elizabeth, <coughs> Sistine Madonna, and St. John installed in Salvador University today. These are a series of four Pompeian style windows by John Lafarge, also at Salvador University. Some of the detail of one of these windows. Now, I just showed you what we did to St. John's face and how to conserve and restore painted glass by John Lafarge. About 15 years or so ago, I was called, I received a call from our church in Springfield that they only have this one window in a light box in the church. Um, the church built a new building and so they only have this one window they put it in the light box and the person on the phone said 
we have a wedding next week and we would like to clean our window, it's really dirty. And I said, well. So he said, what should I use? And I said, well, that's really a loaded question. You can't just clean a stained glass window. You can, but you, you know, I started asking questions. Who made the window? And is, do you have to be careful with the paint? Is it fired? Is it fired well? He said, no, we know that the window is by Lafarge. It's Rebecca the well. And as soon as he said it's by Lafarge, he said, don't clean the window. <laughs> so, again, knowing the fact that Lafarge oftentimes used oil paint or fired paint on his windows, I cautioned the gentleman to not clean it because he could remove some of the paint. And so, but it's really dirty and I'm, you know, we really want to clean it. I just insisted that he not clean it. Well, a few weeks later, I got a call from the pastor of the church that there was something wrong with their window and if I could really look at it. So I drive to Springfield and this is really what I find that, I believe that's Ezekiel and uh, Rebecca, and his face that I have circled and his arm, um, a lot of the paint was, if not all of the paint was gone. And so I, I told the pastor, I said, you know, it's interesting that somebody from the church called me a couple <laughs> weeks ago and I cautioned him not to clean the window. And obviously he didn't listen. And he, the janitor admitted of cleaning the window with Riddle. <laughs> <laughs> but what? But what stunned me is you would think that he would start at a little corner and say, oh, I'm taking off more than I should and stop. He started the face and then it's all, let me go to the arm and just kept on going. So if any of you out there are considering having your windows cleaned and windows conserved, please do not call, um, make sure you call the right people. So now, the windows that we are conserving now uh, that are on exhibit here at Bill Reich's booth, um, again, challenging, um, interesting, um, monumental, in my opinion. Um, they're very um, important windows. And it's interesting how it, we worked on the Newport project, Salva Regina, the windows at Salva Regina started in Newport at the Caldwell House went to Fall River, and because of Bill, they went back to Newport. And this is interesting, the window started in a church two miles away from where we are today, ended up in Amherst, Mass, and now they're back in Boston again. And it's, again, it's just nice how things happen and kind of complete the circle. Um, this is a photograph of Christ um, before Restoration, and you'll see that there's um, the blue cabochons, glass, um, or the jewels, however you want to call it in the background, you can see the, the lighter areas or spots in this case are jewels that were missing. Uh, but what's interesting to, um, to point out is the jewels, if you, if you all go out and look at the actual windows, you can see that the jewels protrude out. They're actually maybe an inch or so in thickness. Behind the jewels, there's circled pieces of glass cut some are blue some are green some are teal and so they're all different shades of green and blue and just give this very interesting glow um, so the restoration of this particular panel christ uh, on the left you have the interior view was the viewing side of the window and on the right side you have the exterior side of the window and you can see how all these circle circular jewels and glass are embedded in a sheet of lead um, and the, 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 the hands and the face of Christ are painted on this white opalescent glass which makes it interesting when you are involved in restoration here you can see a little bit on the left side, the figure, of the face of Christ is obviously soot and dirt streaked. Uh, it's a little bit obvious, but on the right side, where some of the jewels were missing, at some point somebody just 
stuck putty or epoxy into the holes to block the sunlight. So we had to, we have to recreate some of these missing jewels. And here's an example of, on the left side you have a green or teal piece of glass that's layered onto the uh, jewel on the interior. Obvious um, lead deterioration, fatigue, cracks that we found that indicate that the lead needs to be replaced when, wherever necessary. But also, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, you have layered windows and they're just layers of dirt. On the right side, it's half of the face of St. John, I'm sorry, of Christ is cleaned and half is not. That's actually dirt that was found on the glass. And so if you have two layers of glass, you have four layers of dirt. If you have four layers of glass, you have eight layers of dirt. And so the more layers, the darker the window and the dirtier. How do you do that? Do you actually remove each layer to get up the drip? Yes. And therefore, the lead also, you have to remove the lead to release it, and you've got to put it back as much as you can the way you originally did. Yes. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> I am blessed. <laughs> so here's a photograph of Christ before, and here's a photograph of Christ after, which you can see outside. And... Don't call these guys from Australia. Right? <laughs> call us. <laughs> and I'm just going to quickly run through some of the Lafarge joints we restored. This is Purity uh, at Trinity Church. Uh, we restored a few years ago. These are the path and the porch <coughs> and every tower we restored at Wellesley College, Hilton Chapel. This is a different Rebecca at the well from a church in Medford. We did not the face and the hands. This is the triptych Alpha, Old Philosopher, and Omega from the Crane Library in Quincy. And this is our last Lafarge restoration. We actually reinstalled this window this past Monday at uh, West Roxbury Emanuel Church. And that's all I have to say about Lafarge and my relationship with him. Nancy Netzer received her BA from Connecticut College and her PhD from Harvard. She's a specialist in European medieval art and the history and philosophy of museums from the classical period to the present. She is professor of art history and director of the Macmillan Museum at Boston College. Prior to coming to BC in 1990, Nancy worked with the medieval collection at the MFA for seven years. Nancy has an extensive publications record on a variety of subjects in the arts. Most of the acclaim that the exhibitions and programs at the McMullen Museum has received over the past 20 years are due to Nancy's leadership, scholarship, and vision. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Nancy Netzer, who will speak about the McMullen Museum at age 20. <laughs> generous introduction and to you and Allison for your splendid gift and this glorious reception this evening. Tony Fusco, congratulations on another inspiring show and thank you and your partner for hosting us. And thank all of you for coming to celebrate the unveiling of Roberta Rosa's superb restoration of the windows in Medios race. We can't wait to see the final result. Many of you are here because you've played a key role in shaping the McMullen's narrative of the last 20 years. And I'd like to take this opportunity to extend my gratitude to you. My part in this evening's program is to provide an overview of the context into which these magnificent stained glass windows fit 
in Boston College's McMullen Museum. As many of you know, the museum opened in its current space 20 years ago, this past October. A few years later, the museum was named in recognition of a gift from John and Jacqueline McMullen, whom you see in the photo on the bottom left with Boston College President Father William Leahy and former President Father Donald Monin. Since 1993, the McMullen Museum has mounted 58 exhibitions and produced dozens of scholarly catalogs. Much of this work has been undertaken as the result of the generosity and loyal support of the museum's patron committee, a group founded by Nancy and Jack Joyce, whom you see in the photo above at the opening, and currently chaired by Mike Daly, whom you see in the photo below at the podium at the celebration of our 10th anniversary. Now, I'm pleased to see that everyone here tonight looks the same as they do <laughs> in the photos. That the Lafarge windows have been donated by Bill and Allison Vareka in honor of Jesuit Father Lafarge, a visionary social activist, and Fathers Leahy Monin and William Neenan of Boston College seems supremely fitting. As you will glean from the following rehearsal of developments at the McMullen over the past two decades. When I took up my post at Boston College in the early 1990s, my two bosses, Fathers Monin and Neenan, agreed that Boston College would depart from practices of other university museums by linking its museum's mission to faculty research across disciplines and methodological frontiers. Given the unusual collaborative spirit embodied by the faculty at Boston College, we decided to take the risk that their research could become the lifeblood of our fledgling museum. Let me give you some examples of the rewards that came from taking that risk. We opened the museum in 1993 by mounting the American debut of the finest Irish watercolors and drawings from the National Gallery of Ireland in Dublin. Fathers Monin and Neenan can attest that it was no easy task to convince an established institution like the National Gallery to lend 75 of its treasures to a new museum. Lest any of you underestimate their powers of persuasion. As hoped, the Irish Studies faculty at Boston College collaborated with colleagues from abroad to write a seminal accompanying catalog comprising scholarly essays that changed the course of inquiry on the visual art of 18th, 19th, and early 20th century Ireland. Since that initial exhibition of Irish watercolors, the McMullen has organized eight others, accompanied by volumes of essays, bringing to the fore unexplored and neglected aspects of Irish art and material culture. The most recent venture which you see on the screen, was a trailblazing exploration curated by Vera Kreilkamp and Diana Larson of what we called the inside story of rural Ireland. The McMullen exhibitions and publications have been reviewed in the Irish press as primary contributions to the admittance of Irish visual arts into the canon of world art. I'm pleased to say that the McMullen is now in the process of preparing for 2016 the first comprehensive exhibition of Irish arts and crafts movement from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Since 1995, Boston College's large and renowned faculty in medieval studies has organized several innovative exhibitions with spectacular medieval objects from around the world, analyzing novel questions like how these objects embody the idea of memory, how, messages, how the messages these objects convey to viewers has changed over the course of hundreds of years as their location and as the objects themselves were fragmented, and how their dialogue with viewers blurred the line between the sacred 
and the secular. As the years progress, several institutions eager to benefit from the expertise of our faculty have formed partnerships with the McMullen. Such collaborations allowed us to bring to Boston for the first time the unparalleled treasures from the Rockefeller Collection at Asia Society in New York. The eminence of our Islamic art historians, Professors Jonathan Bloom and Sheila Blair, rewarded us with an invitation to catalog the spectacular David collection of Islamic art in Copenhagen and curate our Cosmophilia exhibition, which made its American debut at the McMullen and then traveled to the Smart Museum at the University of Chicago. Partnership with the 300-year-old Royal Society of Antiquaries of London and the Yale Center for British Art allowed us to unite 150 treasures from both institutions, first at the McMullen and then at the Yale Center, including a 1225 version of Magna Carta, which you see in the case at the lower right. Another Yale museum, the University Art Gallery, approached Boston College classics professor Gail Hoffman to collaborate on organizing an exhibition of Yale's archaeological material from excavations at the late antique early Christian site of Dura Europus in modern Syria, which is probably sadly destroyed now. That exhibition, for which our assistant director Diana Larson designed for the McMullen, which you see here, a space is approximating the Dura Europa City Gate, ancient synagogue, baptistry, and Mithraeum has now become part of the highly acclaimed permanent installation at the Yale Art Gallery, which opened last year. Yale has invited the McMullen to collaborate on a sequel exhibition with a team of scholars from both institutions, as well as many from institutions abroad, entitled Roman in the Provinces. Once again, the McMullen is producing the catalog while Yale supplies most of the objects. The exhibition will open at Yale next fall and will come to the McMullen in February of 2015. In 2002, we partnered with the Berlinische Gallery and the University of Toronto to catalog and bring to the McMullen a virtually unknown collection of 70 self-portraits by German artists from the 1920s and 30s in the exhibition Reclaiming a Lost Generation. The works on paper survived because they were smuggled out of Germany at the bottom of a suitcase on the eve of the Holocaust by their owner Siegbert Feldberg. Fewer than half of the artists portrayed, many young at the time, survived the war. The exhibition has since been mounted at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Another fruitful partnership has been formed with the Royal Museums of Belgium in Brussels through Boston College professor Jeffrey Howe, who was initially asked to co-curate the Royal Museum's exhibition on paintings and drawings of this symbolist artist, Fernand Knopf, on whom Howe is the world expert. The exhibition opened at the Royal Museums in 2004 and then came to the McMullen, providing American audiences with their first retrospective of this extraordinary Belgian artist's work. Jeffrey Howe has collaborated again with the Royal Museum on our current exhibition, Corbet Mapping Realism. And President Leahy was barely in his office 20 minutes when he gave Jeff Howe and me an enthusiastic go-ahead to pursue one of our most visited exhibitions, Edvard Munch, Psyche, Symbol, and Expression. The exhibition brought together Munch's works from various collections in Norway and the United States, subjecting them to the new research by a team of scholars from various disciplines. Now Jeffrey Howe is assembling another team of scholars, to organize an exhibition for 2015 on none other than John Lafarge, for which our new windows will serve as a centerpiece. The McMullen has mounted several other interdisciplinary explorations of individual artists like Roberto Mata, 
Our exhibition, Mata, Making the Invisible Visible, was curated by a team of scholars headed by Boston College <coughs> theology and Spanish professors Roberto and Elizabeth Goitzueta. And these two are curating another pioneering retrospective, this one on the Cuban surrealist Wilfredo Lam, that will open at the McMullen this coming September and then travel to the High Museum in Atlanta. Professor Stephen Schlosser, a Jesuit historian of modern France, who had been one of the few scholars permitted to study the archives of Georges Rouault, put together a team to rethink the artist's of and to mount for the McMullen in 2008, the largest exhibition of this artist's work since that at the, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in the 1950s. Professor Schlosser also has the distinction of editing the museum's heaviest catalog, <laughs> comprising over 600 pages. Reviews claimed that the project revolutionized understanding of this artist. And just last fall, philosophy professor John Salas put together a team of philosophers and art historians to mount, in collaboration with the Centrum Paul Clay in Bern, the first exhibition to explore Clay's philosophical vision. And how could I fail to mention the McMullen exhibition of 1999, Saints and Sinners, co-curated by a team of scholars headed by BC's professor of Italian, Franco Mormondo, in which Caravaggio's Taking of Christ, discovered in the Jesuits' Dublin resi residence, made its debut. Last spring, the McMullen assembled another group of scholars from around the globe to mount an exhibition examining the university's Jesuit heritage. Portugal, Jesuits, and Japan brought together exquisite works from public and private collections in Portugal and America to explore the exchange of objects, styles, and ideas facilitated by Portuguese trade ships moving between Europe and Asia in the 16th and 17th centuries. I could go on, but fortunately for you, time only permits a sampling of our 58 exhibitions. All of these exhibitions live on through their catalogs, currently designed and edited in-house at the McMullen by Assistant Director John McCoy and Publications Manager Kate Schugert, respectively. And on our websites, and we trust, through the memories of the hundreds of thousands of visitors that have seen them. It's especially heartening that a large percentage of any university museum audience is young. With any luck, our expansion of the art historical canon an introduction of new interpretations from multiple perspectives will have a lasting impact on the next generation of museum goers. So that provides some of the highlights of the McMullen at 20. We look forward to many more exhibitions now in the works. And as the result of a generous pledge from the McMullen Foundation, the university has plans to present to the city of Boston for their review and planning permission, drawings to expand the McMullen's facilities in an exciting new location on the BC Brighton campus, the former Cardinal's residence at 2101 Commonwealth Avenue. Here are a few of the architect's preliminary renderings of how that facility might look. The plans call for a new entrance building, academic conference rooms on the first floor of the old residence, and exhibition galleries on the second and third floors. If you look carefully, you will see that the large windows feature prominently in the new glass entrance hall. They will stand as an ever-present reminder of Allison and Bill Vareka, and fathers Leahy, Monin, Neenan, and Lafarge who, as you've heard in brief, did so much to start what the Wall Street Journal dubbed the little museum that could on this journey that made it so much more than a sum of its parts. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Roberto.
of thanks to all of you. If there are a couple of questions, I'm sure Nancy and Roberto or I would be happy to try to answer them. And then I might suggest the show is open till eight o'clock. You're uh, willing, you're able, uh, uh, free to uh, browse. And I would ask uh, maybe Nancy and Roberto um, after questions to assemble at the window in case there are any specific questions about um, the, the technique of creating them and also the restoration process. So are there a couple of questions, maybe? Yes, sir. Quick question. Did John LaFarge himself ever do stained glass work other than oil painting on glass? Did he ever touch lead and, and piece together a stained glass? Yeah, Roberto, uh, he, uh, I know that he was hands-on as Roberto was in the restoration process. Uh, he did, um, especially in the beginning, but he did travel a lot overseas, but yes, especially in his first windows, uh, the battle window and uh, for Harvard University Memorial Hall. But um, the answer is yes, he was hands-on. Uh, at one point, he employed th 30 artisans and artists and craftsmen, so he was not that hands-on, but yes, he was hands-on, especially in the beginning. Yes. I'm curious about the decision. Um, you mentioned that some of the places that were thinking of maybe getting those windows wanted to take the inscription at the top and the and the memorial yes. thing mm -hmm. at the bottom off. Yes. And that that would harm the integrity of the of the work. I was curious because I thought about that when I first saw them. Why would taking the part at the bottom, the person who was made for, well, because it would highlight the. Yeah, but you're altering the artist's work. Right. Lafarge himself was involved with the design of the lettering. Of the lettering. All aspects, okay. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and in the, in this case, breaking up the triptych also would alter his. Well, that I would scheme. understand. It was really the thing at the bottom that mm -hmm. I had a question about. Yes. yes. Can you tell me something about Tiffany? I understand that he was. Uh, Lafarge was a mentor to Tiffany? Well, they were actually great competitors, and there was an infamous lawsuit uh, between the two firms because Tiffany had violated some of the patents that Lafarge uh, had taken in um, some of the revolutionary uh, advances in stained glass design. Unfortunately, Lafarge lost the case. Uh, probably didn't have as good a lawyer as Tiffany. Tiffany was much more successful, of course. Mike. Then you're raising money for the restoration of the expense. Yes. Do you have an address or a designation or a deed? <laughs> <laughs> My wife is the chair of the patrons committee. Um, <laughs> and, and so he's asking the appropriate question. There, there are. Uh, some donation envelopes in my booth, which we've been passing out uh, throughout the show, and you're welcome to stop by and pick one up. It has the image of the triptych on the front of it. Uh, the project was estimated uh, to cost about $100,000. We've raised 15000 so far, which financed the initial restoration of uh, half of the price uh, image. Thank you. Yes? yes. I'd just like to say thank you for all of the, the patrons and the Boston College community for all you have contributed to uh, the museum, the Smiley Museum. It's been a, such a great supporter. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'll turn it over to Tony, but uh, the show's open till 8. Uh, you're welcome to browse, and then maybe Nancy and Roberto and I will go down to the windows in case there's some specific questions. Yes. That's exactly what I was going to say. The show is open until 8 o'clock. And outside, you'll find copies of this American Fine Art Magazine, which had a wonderful full feature on the windows. There are copies out there for you. Thank you.